Hey folks, welcome to a quick overview of the IPv4 header from trainingcity.com. On workshop at Training City, we make extensive use of the Wireshark protocol analyzer. Wireshark is a great tool for you to download and use at home. It's open source software and runs on all major operating systems. Wireshark is fairly straightforward and easy to use. You can be up and running in just a few minutes. For more information on Wireshark, you can either attend our Wireshark workshop or check out some of our other YouTube videos, including Introduction to Wireshark. Here I have some captured TCPIP packets that I captured from this computer a moment ago. In this file, we have filtered for SIP, Session Initiation Protocol. SIP is a signaling protocol used in voice and video over IP. It is part of TCPIP, that is to say the standards for SIP are defined by the Internet Engineering Task Force, and it uses, in this case, UDP and IP to transmit the SIP message throughout your network. Here we see SIP over UDP over IP over Ethernet. We can open the Ethernet header and we'll see destination MAC address and source MAC address and the type field. In Ethernet, there may be one more field right here between source and type called the VLAN tag, but it's not especially common. Okay, so today we want to explore the IP header Internet protocol. Let's increase the size of this middle window and bring up the bottom window just a little bit. When we click on the IP header in Wireshark, we see in the bottom window the actual bytes of data that are contained in the IP header. Note that when I click on the Ethernet header, the Ethernet bytes are highlighted. Whenever you see two hex numbers in Wireshark, you're looking at one byte of data. Each hex number represents four bits. Ethernet header, IP header, UDP header, SIP message. Back to the IP header. You'll note that the IP header is 1, 2, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 bytes in size. IP headers, IP version 4 headers, can vary in length. As a side note, IP version 6 headers cannot vary in length. They are 40 bytes, although they do have extension headers. In any case, it is not especially common for IP version 4 headers to vary. They are almost always 20 bytes, but it is possible. Let's take a look at some of the major fields in an IP version 4 header. The IP version 4 header begins with a version number. These first four bits, not the entire byte, unfortunately, it's highlighted as one byte, but the first four bits of that byte, where it says literally the hex number 4, tells us that we're dealing with IP version 4. The next field, where we see hex number 5, tells us the length of the IP header. In this case, as we saw a moment ago, 20 bytes. The differentiated service field is used for QoS. We are able to define within diffServe, as it's known, multiple classes of service. With these classes of service enabled in the policies of our routers, 
in our corporate network, it is possible to prioritize one IP packet over another IP packet when they are, for example, in the queue of a router waiting to be passed out the next link or the next hop. Here we see an IP packet where all of the diff serve bits have been set to zero. What that means is that this IP packet does not request any particular class of service that would give it prioritization. We explore the diff serve field in detail in the Training City TCPIP hands-on workshop. The next field we see is total length of the IP packet and its payload. Note that the total length of the IP packet is 604 bytes. But if we look at the entire size of the Ethernet frame, it's 618 bytes. What accounts for the difference? Well, what do you think? Look closely. Total length of the IP packet and payload. Total bytes on the wire. If we subtract 604 bytes from 618 bytes, we are left with 14 bytes. When we look at the Ethernet header, we see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 bytes. Ethernet headers, as we saw a moment ago, consist of a destination MAC address, which is 6 bytes in length, a source MAC address, another 6 bytes, and the type field, which is 2 bytes. If there's a VLAN tag, by the way, that would make the Ethernet header a total of 16 bytes, and this would read 620. So, what accounts for the difference between this number and this number? The Ethernet header. Why doesn't IP include the Ethernet header in the total length? Well, Ethernet is used to transmit this IP packet and its payload from one location in the local area and that work, say your laptop, through an Ethernet switch and either to the printer or another laptop or possibly to the router to be passed on to another data link connection that may not in fact use Ethernet. That is to say the IP packet may use MPLS to be transmitted across the fiber optic link. The IP packet remains intact as it moves through the router, but the Ethernet header is removed. So this total length field tells us the size of the IP packet, the layer 3, the network layer, packet size. The next three header fields in an IP version 4 header go together. The identification field, the flags field, and the fragment offset field. The flags field tells IP routers whether or not they are permitted to fragment this packet and if the packet has in fact been fragmented, whether there are more fragments to come. Identification, flags, and fragment offset combine to allow large IP packets to be broken up into multiple smaller IP packets by a device such as a router and then be reassembled at the far end device. How is it possible? Each fragment receives the same identification number but a different offset number. The offset number measures the number of bytes. So for example this would be the first packet, fragment offset 0, but if this packet was part of a larger fragmented packet, or this uh, fragmented packet was part of a larger original IP packet, then we would see an offset number here telling us where this packet needs to be reassembled with the previous one. All the fragments then have the same identification number, 
but a sequential fragment offset. In modern data networks, both local area networks and wide area networks, fragmentation of IP packets is fairly uncommon. Years ago, when we were dealing with limited WAN bandwidth, particularly limited WAN accessibility bandwidth, dial-up modems, very early DSL, fractional T1s, it was not uncommon to program or policies into routers that would fragment IP packets over a certain size, 1,000 bytes, for example, to help optimize the sharing of the bandwidth resources. This functionality today is largely unneeded. In fact, these three header fields, flags, fragment offset, and identification, are not included in the base IPv6 header. Next field we see is time to live. If you look, this is a one byte field. In this particular case, it's set to 128. For those of you who are binary to decimal or binary to hex experts, you'll note that 8 would um, uh, 0 would correspond to 128 decimal if we were to do the conversion. How does it work? The time to live value can be set to any number by the originating device. Each time the IP packet passes through a router, the router must decrement the time to live value by one. The purpose of the time to live field is to provide loop avoidance. That is to say, avoid an IP packet passing from one data link technology to another data link technology through a router to another and another and returning to the original point. That is the definition of an IP loop. By having each router decrement the IP packet by one, eventually, if a packet were trapped in a loop, this number would reach one, it would arrive at a router, the router would decrement it to zero, and at that point, the router is not permitted to continue passing this packet on to the next hop or the next data link. It must delete the packet and send a message an internet control message protocol, ICMP message, to the originator's IP address saying, I have deleted your packet and this is the reason the time to live value was exceeded. Windows by default sets this value to 128. Linux and Unix by default set this value to 255. Next we see a protocol, the header field protocol. This tells the IP layer what protocol is being carried in the IP packet. In this example, it is carrying UDP. Note that UDP is defined as number 11 hex or 17 decimal. The definition of these numbers exists in IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority website. The header checksum, again, is a field that is not needed so much anymore. It is a field that did provide a type of error correction or error detection, still does, I suppose, um, that was more needed when we were dealing with more rudimentary wide area and local area networks. That is to say, networks that could, in fact, incur losses or have noise on the wire that could cause uh, changes in the header packet, the header uh, fields. Today we tend to send IP packets over highly reliable fiber optic networks and the header checksum is less significant. Again, this is a field that we will find has been removed from the IPv6 header. Next we see the source and destination IP addresses. You'll see them written here in the familiar dotted decimal notation. 
If you look down here, you'll see a hex equivalent, 1, 2, 3, 4 bytes, or 32 bits. IPv4 addresses are 32 bits long, written normally in this dotted decimal, 8, 8, 8, 8 bits, total of 32 bits. IPv6 addresses are 128 bits long. It's for this reason that we find the IPv6 core header, basic header, to be 40 bytes, not 20 bytes. This IP header does not include an options field, but it is possible. We discuss the options field in detail in the TCPIP hands-on workshop. So to recap, we've explored the IP version 4 header of a TCPIP packet. It is being transmitted over Ethernet. The header and its payload are 604 bytes. On the wire we see 618 bytes, which includes the Ethernet header. We looked at the version, header length, diff serve, total length fields. We discussed how the identification flags and fragment offset field really go together to accomplish IP packet fragmentation, which is, was done when an IP packet was relatively large and in a slow early network from decades ago. We may wish to fragment that packet to allow others to share the bandwidth better. In a modern network, we really don't need these three fields and they're removed from the IPv6 header. We discussed how the time to live field is used to avoid loops. The protocol field tells IP devices what protocol it's carrying at the next higher layer. Header checksum, again, not needed as much anymore and removed from IPv6. And finally, we looked at the source and destination IP addresses. I hope you found this overview of the IPv4 header to be useful, and I hope you also see the value of doing Wireshark captures on your home network or your lab network and actually going in and exploring these fields on your own. Once again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact Training City. We hope to see you in our TCPIP workshop. Thanks and have a great day.